This is linear viscoelasticity, uh, video number two for polymer rheology and processing, part two. So we went over this in the first video for viscoelast linear viscoelasticity, but I'll go over it again just to, uh, just to review. The definition of viscoelasticity is the simultaneous existence of viscous and elastic properties in a material. Uh, the assumption should be made that all real materials are viscoelastic. So they possess both viscous and elastic properties in any material based on the time scale of that experiment. And when we talk about the time scale of the experiment versus the natural time of the material, we're talking about the Debra number. And um, while we touched on this in the first video, I won't go over this more here, but it's important to remember when you're talking about viscoelasticity that time scale is extremely important. So again, we saw this in uh, the uh, viscoelasticity part one, but to go over this again, these are your model systems, your mechanical models to describe viscoelasticity. The first one being a spring, the second one being a dash pot. We touched on the Ma Maxwell's model in the first video, and we're going to talk about the Voigt or Kelvin model in this particular uh, video. So we've seen these before, uh, but to go over this again, you have the purely elastic response of the spring. So you apply a stress, you hold that stress, and you remove the stress, and there's recovery in a purely elastic response. In a viscous, purely viscous response, represented by the dash pot, you apply a stress and it linearly, uh, strain linearly uh, um, grows until the stress is removed. And that's a viscous type of, of um, response, purely. Previously, we saw that we had the Maxwell model. And this is a simple model that uses springs and dash pots to model viscous and elastic behavior, where the spring and the dash pot are in series. And we're going to look at a different thing where the spring and the dash pot are in parallel. And that is the Voigt model. So you have the same thing, you have a spring and you have a dash pot, but these are in parallel instead. And this is best represented by this particular expression here, where you have shear stress related to the um, shear rate times a rigidity modulus, times viscosity times a shear rate um, shown here. So this is the viscous component and this is the elastic component. So this is represented by the spring and this is represented by the dash pot. The Maxwell model essentially assumes a uniform distribution of stress. Now we're assuming a uniform distribution of strain with the Voigt model. Strain in both elements of the model is the same and the total stress is the sum of the two contributions. So it is strain, strain one plus strain two. When you have an when in the Voigt model, you, it gives a retarded elastic response but does not allow for ideal stress relaxation. Uh, the stress relaxation response is typical for the Maxwell model. In this model, it can't be instantaneously deformed to a given strain. Um, but in this case, creep is a constant. So what you actually get from this particular model is a more realistic uh, um, growth here, but you don't get the same sort of uh, relaxation response that is con consistent with regular, uh, real data. So here we have this expression. If a stress here is cons suddenly applied at time zero and held constant, you get this particular relationship. And this gives you this particular time uh, relationship. And this is related to viscosity divided by rigidity modulus. This is defined as the retardation time. Uh, the reason this is a K is because it's sometimes called the Kelvin model. This has dimensions of time, and it controls the rate of growth of strain or shear rate after the application of stress. So here we have the Hook model and the Voigt model. So here, when you apply uh, when you uh, apply a stress, you get this particular strain. So instantaneously deformed, instantaneous strain. With the Voigt model, you get strain growth over a period of time, which is more appropriate for a sort of viscous viscoelastic response. So the differences between the two. In the development of strain growth in the Voigt model, you have an equilibrium value of strain um, that grows until one. Uh, in the Hook model, that uh, all, also equals one, but you don't. But you reach equilibrium instantaneously in the Hook model. So it, as soon as you apply uh, the stress, you get instantaneous strain or deformation. In the Voigt model, it reaches that equilibrium, which is the same as the Hook model, but a delayed rate, and that is uh, delayed by the tau sub k, or viscosity divided by rigidity modulus, or relaxation time. So we have another mathematical derivation to go through. Um, here we have these two elements in parallel. 
So we have shear stress um, times beta sub zero times strain, beta sub says one times strain. And here we can assign uh, beta sub zero is rigidity modulus, beta sub one is viscosity. This gives us this particular relationship that we started with. So remember, these are additive. So in this case, this term equals the, uh, the uh, shear stress of the elastic portion, and this equals the shear stress of the viscous portion to give you this. So this equals that time plus that. Spring dash pot. Now these are simple models. They can't do everything and there are problems with each of them. They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses. The Maxwell model cannot account for a retarded elastic response. It can't do creep. Uh, the Voigt model does not describe stress relaxation. So, um, and these are both characterized by single relaxation times. Uh, what would be more realistic is a spectrum of relaxation times. So um, these are simple models and they do approximate viscoelastic behavior better than a lot of other things, but they're not perfect. So um, what you're actually looking at when you're looking at this sort of uh, model is not a simple uh, equation. Typically it's a differential equation that looks something like this. Um, in this case, n equals m or n equals m minus 1. Shear stress is represented by sigma, strain is represented by gamma, and uh, uh, stress and strain are now functions of time in this particular uh, dif differential equation. You can replace them with their tensor generalizations, so um, this can become much more complicated uh, as you go on. So you can start uh, creating general cases of this equation and we'll start seeing equations that we've, we recognize a little better. So if B sub zero is the only non-zero parameter, we have this relationship, and this is hooky in elasticity. So beta sub zero is the rigidity modulus so in this case. So that is the uh, equation of a spring. If beta sub one is the only non-zero parameter, we have this relationship. Um, so where beta sub one would be viscosity, this is shear stress, uh, shear rate, viscosity. That is Newtonian viscous flow. So these can all be reduced down to their simple equations that we're a little more um, familiar with at this point. So uh, we can take beta sub zero to be to be rigidity modulus, beta sub one to be viscosity. We assume they're both non-zero and we put that into this equation and what we get out of it is the Kelvin or Voigt model equation. So we're a little more complicated, describes a viscoelastic material, but still in terms that we're familiar with from before. Now, as I mentioned, the Maxwell model and the Voigt model are not perfect. So there are ways to take this up a level in complexity and get a better uh, mechanical model that produces better equations to describe viscoelastic properties. Um, and in this case, uh, we had two non-zero parameters. If we make three parameters non-zero, we get the Jeffries model or the Berger's model, depending on what parameters those are. So in the Jeffries model, alpha one, beta one, and beta two are non-zero parameters. And that equation translates to the equation shown here. So stress plus tau sub m times viscous stress equals viscosity times uh, shear, some strain plus uh, T sub J times another strain. There are two time constants shown here. This is uh, one from the Maxwell's equation, and this is one f this from this equation specifically, from the Jeffries model. The more time constants you have, the closer you get to a spectrum of time constants, which is more appropriate. Shown here, you have A and B. A is an extension of the Voigt model, uh, where you have a dash pot in series with a spring and dash pot in parallel. And then B is an extension of the Maxwell model, where you have um, the Maxwell model shown here in parallel with a dash pot. This is the Burgos, Burgers model. Uh, the Maxwell representation is the basis for this equation shown here. Um, and this involves four simple elements given by this equation. And so it breaks down uh, P sub M into these two uh, time constants, and you have an extra time constant shown here, 
and it also breaks uh, viscosity down into two constants, and these two time constants are also shown here as related to this equation, the Maxwell representation. These are all time constants. Again, the more time constants you have, the closer you have to representing true viscoelastic behavior. Here you have a Maxwell model in series with a Voigt model, and here you have a Maxwell model in parallel to form a Voigt model. So this is a little bit different than Jeffrey's model. Um, both of them are represented by the, that, that Berger's equation. And this concludes uh, part two of linear viscoelasticity. Thank you.